What's going on, guys? This is James Allen. I am recording this on Monday, January 12, 2026. This is my first episode of the year, and uh, I thought a great way to start it was to give you guys uh, a picture of the blockchain industry as a whole. What does the state of the blockchain industry look like? And where does Caspa fit in, right? Caspa and other networks. But this is the Caspa team, right? So we're primarily concerned about you know, Caspa, but we will cover other networks. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to talk about six networks that I believe are important in terms of their scale or cultural significance and in terms of Caspa, in terms of their long-term strategic implication that they have for the industry as a whole. Uh, these six networks are Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, Polkadot, uh, and Caspa, I believe those are the six, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, Polkadot, Caspa. So yeah, I have all six correctly. Let's start with Bitcoin. That's the easiest. Bitcoin has become Wall Street. You know, I've already made a video on that. Bitcoin is no longer the people's token. It is now the Wall Street token. And there is uh, many proofs that, you know, you could find to reveal that this statement is obvious. The first one being Bitcoin's market cap. It's nearly $2 trillion. Another one is the massive capital flow uh, through Bitcoin ETFs. That's a clear signal of Wall Street adoption. Millions, if not hundreds of millions, have flown into Bitcoin through those ETFs. Clearly, that's a Wall Street vehicle. But even in a more uh, subtle sense, uh, we, we have seen that Satoshi Nakamoto has become more or less uh, a mythic figure in Bitcoin. Uh, this new stage Bitcoin is, is in is represented by Michael Saylor. Michael Saylor is the new face of Bitcoin. It's the institutional face of Bitcoin. After all, the guy, I believe, pumped nearly 40 or 50 billion behind Bitcoin through his company strategy. So Bitcoin has a new face that represents its new phase of Wall Street institutional success. And success brings its own problem. Right now, Bitcoin has an issue in terms of uh, role definition. There's a crisis in the Bitcoin community about what can Bitcoin be, right? And like any major crisis, there's two camps. There's a conservative camp, which is saying Bitcoin is digital gold. Uh, it's finished by design. Let's not touch it. Uh, it's just a high value asset where, pe where people park their money. Let's leave Bitcoin alone. That's the conservative camp. Uh, it's digital gold. Gold doesn't evolve. Let's leave it alone. But then there's another camp, the expansionist camp. And they're saying, no, Bitcoin can be more. It could be a living network. We could add expressiveness to Bitcoin. We could do that by adding layer twos, covenants, new primitives that gives Bitcoin new functionalities. And this contention... Can Bitcoin evolve while remaining digital gold is, in fact, a crisis in the Bitcoin community. So interesting. Now, let's look at Ethereum. Ethereum is also an institutional network. It has also achieved mainstream success. Uh, there are millions flowing to Ethereum via the ETFs. Uh, and I believe Ethereum have a, has a market cap of uh, $355 billion. Now, this pales compared to Bitcoin, right? Because Bitcoin's market cap is $1.75 trillion. So Ethereum doesn't even have a third of Bitcoin's market cap. However, if you look at Ethereum from an engineering lens, a network throughput lens, it is by far the most successful blockchain. Ethereum still has the number one uh, most smart contract deployed. Ethereum is a network that has the highest number of smart contract deployed. That's massive success. It has the most developer activity on GitHub. It also has the most developer tools and edu educational ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, Ethereum also has the most total value locked in terms of DeFi. So when you look at Ethereum from a lens of network throughput, it is the most successful chain by far. So even though Ethereum doesn't shine as much in the institutional success domain is Bitcoin. In terms of engineering throughput, the network is number one. However, even though its success lies in engineering, its main problem also lies in engineering, which makes sense, right? Um, right now, Ethereum is going through fragmentation because of too many layer twos. 
there are so many layer twos on Ethereum that Ethereum could barely keep up. It's losing its soul, <laughs> literally. I believe one analyst found that there's about 129 uh, layer twos, at least 129 layer twos on Ethereum. Uh, but we we could we could just name a few, uh, such as uh, Arbitrum, right? Um, Arbitrum is one. Base, uh, Polygon, Optimism, right? Those are four main layer twos. It's just, it's just off the top of my head, right? But there are so many more, and it's fragmenting Ethereum, right? Uh, so Ethereum's crisis is how do we coordinate all these layer twos so that cross-chain assets, assets that are crossing across assets that are crossing through numerous layer twos, you know, could be done smoothly. Because if it's not done smoothly, the app experience on Ethereum will be very shitty, right? So Ethereum has a crisis of coordinating all these different layer twos. That's that's a unique problem to have. Now let's move on to Solana. Solana is not an institutional success like Bitcoin or Ethereum. However, it does lead in a sense of um, market success purely in a domain of speculation. What I mean by that is Solana has the most meme coin activity out of all the networks. You know, it is pretty much the meme coin network. You know, uh, one analyst, I believe, found about 32 million uh, different meme coins on Solana. That's an insane number. Most of them have been from pump.fun. Uh, but whenever people want to speculate, Solana is typically the chain they go for that. And that in of itself is a form of success. However, that kind of success bring its own critics, right? Uh, there's a lot of critics who are saying, hey, gambling is not really economic development, right? <laughs> gambling is not a form of economic development. They're basically saying like, yes, Solana has insane network activities, but many of them are bots and many of them are low value transactions like speculation. Uh, the second crisis Solana is facing is uh, more important to me, at least as a, as a builder. That is, Solana has had several network outages in the past, and it's also been compromised several times. Uh, I believe uh, one serious report uh, found about 32 verified uh, security incidents in a Solana network. And to a builder, that, that screams red flag, right? The, the network does not look stable to a builder like myself. Uh, an engineer like me, we want to put our application on a network that's very stable, right? And when we look at Solana and how many times it's been compromised, um, it doesn't look good. So Solana has the issue of uh, defeating its network outage history and also showing some sort of depth in terms of the transaction, the kind of transaction it hosts. So uh, Solana's crisis is, can you ever show us boring reliability and stability? Can Solana ever show us this boring reliability that an engineer needs to migrate to your network? The next chain is Cardano, which is pretty much the very opposite of Solana. If Solana is exciting and fun and speculative, the animal spirits are really strong in Solana. Cardano is like the boring cousin, right? Cardano is very boring, but very stable, very reliable. Cardano has shown tremendous engineering and philosophical discipline. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I believe uh, Cardano has the highest uh, staking participant. Uh, you know, the, like Cardano staking is off the chain. Like, so the community is very loyal. It's not a speculative uh, community. They, they've shown that they're with Cardano long term. And uh, even though Cardano, when it first came out, it, it was touting itself as the third generation blockchain. It's really revealing to be the governance chain, right? And we could argue Charles Hoskinson, the founder and uh, main figure of Cardano, has really drove that home in his speeches, his lectures. He really stressed governance quite a bit. In fact, uh, during my early stages as a Web3 developer, I did not really think of Web3 in terms of governance. I only saw it as DeFi because I was still thinking in terms of Ethereum. But um, after watching Cardano speak, I mean, Charles Hoskins, Hoskinson speak a few times, it became clear to me that blockchain was much more than just decentralized finance, and the governance point was driven home by Cardano. Now, even though Cardano has the highest staking participation, very engineering, um, uh, has good engineering discipline, uh, it does struggle with speed. That is, uh, because Cardano is so formal in its execution, there's a lot of peer reviews, a lot of research, 
a lot formal process before Cardano like really moves on something. That slowness is costing them speed and people are getting impatient with Cardano because it's executing so slowly, right? So Cardano's crisis is, will slow correctness survive in a market that rewards speed, right? Uh, since Cardano is moving so slow and deliberately because it wants to do things right, it's not moving at a pace um, uh, that the market wants. The market prefers you move fast, crash and burn, and learn when you have to, right? So can Cardano's correctness survive in a market that rewards speed? That's, that's Cardano's current crisis. The next one is Polkadot, which is actually one of my favorite blockchain, right? I have kind of like a soft spot for Polkadot because it's such an interesting network. And unlike the other protocols, we can't judge Pol Polkadot by like high transaction volumes and stuff like that, right? Because it, it, that's not its design. Uh, you really have to look at uh, how many parachains on Polkadot and the cross-chain messaging traffic, right? You know, are these parachains talking to each other? And the governance load on Polkadot. And by these measures, Polkadot is doing okay, although there is some feud internally inside Polkadot right now. A lot of the people in the community has approached me and told me of insider issues at Polkadot. But Polkadot is still a, a strong chain. However, its issue is, is this. Uh, governance overload, uh, in order to put a parachain up, right, you have to go through auction, you have to go through bonding requirements, and, you know, you have to meet a certain governance standard to keep your parachain up and running. And these auctions, I think, they, you used to have to do them every two years. Polkadot has changed this governance overload and switched to something called Agile Core Time, but this is so recent that I can't speak on it quite yet. So this is still yet to be determined, but governance overload was Polkadot's main issue for some time. However, what I'm realizing Polkadot's true crisis is, is its architectural complexity. To be a, a builder on Polkadot, you have to be a higher order builder. You have to be a higher order engineer to seriously build on Polkadot. There are so many things you have to understand, like shared security, consensus mechanism, cross messaging traffic, um, that a person who's building on Polkadot is really a systems thinker. And I believe these higher order engineers are kind of rare, right? So I think Polkadot's crisis is, is the architectural complexity driving away the builders it needs, right? Because even though Substrate, like I said, um, Substrate is a, um, a framework you use to build your own parachain on Polkadot, I think Substrate is an engineering marvel. But the kind of engineer you need to seriously operate in that world is a no-joke engineer. And it's hard enough to find a mediocre engineer, let alone a higher order engineer. So I think Polkadot's crisis is, is its architectural complexity driving away the builders it needs. So very interesting problem. Now let's move on to Casper, which is uh, you know, the most unorthodox one. Let's, let's save the best for last. Casper is, is, is a new kid on a block, relatively speaking. I believe it came out in uh, late 2021. But already it has a market cap of 1.2 billion uh, without being listed on any major exchanges. That, that, that's a huge signal, right? Uh, Casper has never been on any major exchanges and its market cap is already 1.2 billion. That means there's strong conviction behind this token. And there's good reasons why, as I'll get into it um, uh, in the near future. But if you look at the culture of Casper, you see a culture of quiet conviction, technical seriousness, and post hype immunity, right? These people, they, they, they don't want to hear hype. It's real in Casper, right? Which is why I like it. It's raw and real, no bullshit. And even though it's so young, Casper has already done two things that is rocking the industry. The first one is Casper has demonstrated that proof of work can scale, right? They didn't, they didn't implement a cheap solution like blockchain sharding. They innovated. They basically invented a whole new transportation system like I've talked about. And they've shown that proof of work can indeed scale. Massive breakthrough in a blockchain industry. But the second uh, breakthrough they're currently in the making, in a process of making, is they're rejecting Ethereum's general smart contract, that, which, which is fascinating, right? Casper VProgs is a rejection of Ethereum-style general purpose smart contracts. And I think that's going to rock the industry to its core. It's even changing engineers like me on how I'm engineering my application on how it's going to interact with distributed ledgers. And again, I'll do an episode on that too as I get my hands more dirty 
with Cityscape and Casper. But it's done these two things. It shows that it shown that proof of work can scale, and it rejected Ethereum's uh, general purpose smart contract for very clear reasons, which I'm going to talk about in the next episode where I will discuss VProgs in more in depth. Now, what is Casper's crisis, right? Because Casper does have a bit of a of a crisis, in my opinion, as well. That is, it, right now there is no programmability in Casper. You, you, you know, there's no smart contract in Casper. You know. No programmability, but that's not going to stay like that forever. Vprog will introduce programmability um, uh, to the network, and w what seems to be Casper's main contention is how do how do they time expressiveness without corrupting simplicity, its current simplicity, right? Because you could learn more about what Casper rejects than what it is implementing as an engineer, and again, I'll talk about that in future episodes. There's a certain simplicity and restraint that Casper is introducing to its protocol that's allowing it to scale. But they also want to introduce expressiveness, right? They also want to introduce programmability. And how does it do that without corrupting that simplicity? If, if it doesn't time that correctly, that programmability, if it doesn't time it correctly, let's just say it ships VProgs too early, VProgs will be buggy. Um, uh, misunderstood, and um, it will probably add complexity to the protocol. But if it waits too long to implement VProgs, right, the industry will move on. Developers will look forward to something else, right, and Casper will lose narrative control as well. So there is there is this issue: is how do we time expressiveness without corrupting Casper's original simplicity? Beautiful problem to have because you're really timing your blooming period carefully. Right, so that's an optimistic note, which is why if you look at the symbol I have for Casper, is that of a tree, because it's 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 timing expressiveness the right way, so that uh, even though programmability is now turned on, Casper still remain true to its simplistic roots. Great problem to have, guys. Now to wrap up the video, I'm gonna summarize by going over all the crises of each major network uh, as a review. Uh, so, and I also do want to say that um, if you want to uh, get a more intellectualized version of this video. I have a article on Medium that's basically this video, but like a written form. Uh, I highly recommend you check it out because I do think, like I said, uh, when I express something uh, in written form, there's a certain intellectual nature to it that I just can't deliver when I'm behind a camera and just live and recording like I am right now. So let me go over the six networks and we'll wrap up this video. So here we go. Can Bitcoin evolve while remaining digital gold? That's Bitcoin. Can Bitcoin evolve while remaining digital gold? Has layer two scaling fractured Ethereum soul? Has layer two scaling fractured Ethereum soul? Can Solana ever earn boring reliability? Can Solana ever earn boring reliability? Can Cardano's correctness survive a speed driven market? Is Polkadot's complexity pushing builders away? Will Casper time expressiveness without corrupting simplicity? So yeah, these are the six points. You know, um, uh, these are the six questions or the six conditions we're gonna have to watch for the year of 2026. I hope this uh, video was useful in giving you some bearing so that you could navigate the blockchain space correctly. Uh, if you want to book a consulting session with me, there is a link in the description. But that's all I have for you in this episode. You know what to do, my misfits. Don't forget to press that like button and support me on Patreon. I will see you next time.